Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 109. Stay tuned for more from Glory in Our Midst this week. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahi, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux. Welcome back, Todd. Thanks, Chris. How's life in California there? Uh, it's going well. Um, it's been extremely stormy today. We had like incredible winds, like um, 40 mile an hour, which for us up here in Grass Valley is pretty unusual. So, yeah. How are things in your neck of Texas? Actually, it was the same. It was, uh, it, it was cold today. Not too cold, but it was windy, very windy. <laughs> Have you ever had uh, hurricanes or anything there, or are you too far inland for that? Well, of course, we had Harvey, but I wasn't here last uh, when, when Harvey hit. But okay, so yeah, Houston gets hurricanes once in a while. Nothing usually like Harvey, but but I'm about an hour from the ocean, so wouldn't get hit as hard. I see. Very good. Well. Uh, let's run through the regular housekeeping, and then we can uh, jump right into our discussion this week. Uh, we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast, and there you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. And just a, a friendly reminder that if you do make a purchase through any of the links that uh, we have listed there, it does help me out a little bit. So I appreciate those of you who have uh, made some purchases there. If you could give us a five-star rating on iTunes and subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcatcher, both of those things help boost our visibility to other people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to uh, chip in a little bit of money, um, there is a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page. And any amount that you can give is much appreciated and really does encourage Todd and me. So thank you very much to our donors. And uh, with that, do you want to remind us uh, maybe where we left off last week or should we uh, jump right into, we're in a, a new uh, a new vision this week. We are. Yeah, I'm going to have you read the vision if you don't mind in a moment, but I'll give a quick uh, review. Okay. Um, the first vision, of course, was the captain of the Lord of hosts, the angel of the Lord and his armies um, on their horses in the midst of the myrtle trees, uh, representing uh, God's people and the peace and paradise that God gives them. And and around them, surrounding them are, are the depths of the sea, the deep. Of course, picturing the nations and those that would um, persecute the church and get in the way of God fulfilling his promises. And so we have the then the cry of the angel to the Lord of how long before he fulfills all his promises now that they've returned uh, from Persia and they're back in Jerusalem. And yet so many of the promises hadn't been fulfilled. And then the the Lord responds with an oracle that we looked at last time. Um, that the Lord is jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, and he's angry with the nations. And so he then he gives precious promises of what the Lord will do um, for his people, and we went over those. And so that was the end of the first vision. And so Zechariah one eighteen begins the second vision. And I'll have you read that, and then we'll start working our way through the chapter. Okay. So this is Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? And he said to me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, What are these coming to do? He said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, so that no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations, 
who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. And so Klein begins this section um, identifying the horns, and he calls them here assaulters of Zion, because they are coming after God's people. And Klein begins by reminding us in these visions, prophecy uses prophetic idiom. And so these are prophecies of the new covenant, of what Christ would do. But the new covenant church is described as restored Judah, centered in Jerusalem. And as Klein reminded us last week, in the typology of Israel, we never saw these promises being fulfilled. So we are to look ahead as, as spiritual pictures of what Christ would do uh, for his church. And even when we think of like a promise in Jeremiah 31, that God would restore Judah and Israel. The dispensationalists want to argue that when God says Israel, everyone would have understood it to mean Israel. But so often later in the in, in this era, whenever a prophecy of Israel is, dis- is given, it's important to remember that there was no Israel. Um, by the time that Zechariah's ministry and um, most from then on, Israel had already been uh, um, assumed under Assyria. And so there is really no northern kingdom in this whole second half of the minor prophets. And so Israel had to stand, even for them, they would understand it to mean something beyond the most literal understanding of Israel. And so we're still looking ahead to the new covenant. And we're, and we're given this description of horns. And Klein writes here that really we're to picture horns of an attacking bull. Deadly horns. The verb in verse 21 in the Hebrew is, is used elsewhere. It, 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 horns that terrify, that they scare other animals. Hmm. And so the idea of an attacking bull attacking other animals. And of course, in Daniel and the book of Revelation, horns are most often used to represent political powers against God's people. Um, In Daniel, of course, against Israel, and in Revelation, against the church. And in Daniel 7, Klein brings up, the horns rise up from the deep, which would then unite that idea with the first vision, where you have the deep surrounding God's people. And now, in a sense, the horns rising up from the deep, So, and the very fact that these animals are used in the Bible, these deadly animals, to scare other animals, Klein reminds us that God's people will be pictured often as animals. They are God's flock, his sheep. And so the the raised horns are symbolic of trying to keep God's people down, not allowing God to fulfill his promise to them through persecution, through blasphemy, through mocking. And so when we have the prophecy of cutting off the horns later in the in this vision, it's then a picture of the defeat of their purpose and their judgment. And so the lifting of their heads, the lifting of these four horns, is simply a picture of, of tyranny, of hostility, of um, abusing God's people and uh, doing their best to make sure that those promises are not fulfilled. And the Babylonian captivity itself was Babylon raising its horn against Israel and defeating them and destroying, of course, Israel, I mean, at that time, Judah, and uh, defeating Jerusalem and doing what they did um, to the temple. And so the horns then um, picture, first of all, those who would assault and try to keep God's people from receiving the promises. Any thoughts before we move on to the second portion here? Well, I was going to ask whether the horns in this context in Zechariah 1 uh, were also political powers, but it seems like you uh, maybe answered that at the very end there in terms of the Babylonian captivity. Yes, they definitely represent the nations, which would have been the political powers um, that could keep the promises from being fulfilled in an earthly sense. Mm 
They were certainly doing it at the time, limiting Jerusalem to being a tiny city that they were in control of. And it was their army that surrounded them everywhere. So something would have to happen to these nations uh, for God's promises to be fulfilled. But right now the horns are lifted up against Israel, um, assaulting them with hostility for the purpose that those promises would not be fulfilled. Okay. So Kleinman brings up a point that you don't quite get at first when you read it, but when you put the rest of the book and the Bible together, it really is important to make sense. And that is that lifted horns are not simply directed at the people of God, but they're directed at God in blasphemy. Mm. And so they're lifting their horns against the Lord of Judah, not simply against Judah. And of course, Christ reminded Paul of that when when he was Saul and he was persecuting the church. The Lord says, you're actually persecuting me. And Klein quotes uh, Psalm 74, 18. Remember how the enemy has mocked you, O Lord, how foolish people have reviled your name. And then back up in verse 4. Do not lift up your horns against heaven. And so the horns are lifted up not only against Judah, but really they're blaspheming and mocking God. And so they're almost laughing at him for suggesting that God's people would be able to receive all these glorious promises. And so they're doing what they can in anger and mockery uh, to prove that that cannot happen. Okay. But Klein points out even further that we are to see these horns, even though they are animal horns, not connected to an animal, an animal's body, but ri- rising up out of an altar. Hmm. So you have to imagine an altar for worship um, that men have crafted in idolatry, and then four horns coming from the four side. And one of the reasons he suggests this is because these craftsmen are given the ability to to cut them down. And that idea of cutting them down and needing craftsmen to do it is never really used for animals. You would think he would have called archers or hunters if the vision was simply um, animals. Right. But he, call, he calls craftsmen who are able to cut. So the idea is is that's usually used in the Bible for a fabricated object, not for an animal. Okay. And so that's why the four horns, the, the number four would matter. Some commentators suggest the four may represent universality, like the four winds representing uh, the whole world. But Klein points out the four horns should be four corners of an altar. And some of the evidence he gives in Daniel 2, there's the lifting up the head of the golden image. So the golden image has a head that we might picture horns coming out of. And the golden image is is an altar. That's Mm -hmm. where they worshipped. He mentions in the Enuma Elish, uh, Marduk's temple, uh, the Babylonian god Marduk. His temple had a tower called Esagila. And that means the house of the lifting up of the head. And so think of that. You have the lifting up of horns, which is the head of an animal. And yet the Babylonian god's tower, where the um, the tower is the temple of Marduk, the altar, is also called the house of the lifting up of the head. And also Marduk's temple, it says in that, work that the people looked up to its horns okay and so even in the babylonian image of their temple uh there were horns for the people to look up to and there were horns on the towers and um ziggurats that were symbolizing anti-god powers back then and klein points out that with nimrod who built the original babel and then Nebuchadnezzar, who built, obviously, who was the head of uh, Babylon and, and built, had the mighty altar built, uh, the image, 
they are said to have lift up their horns against God. And then he, he points out also that the altars in Ezekiel are a tiered structure that reminds you of a ziggurat. Again, a, a temple image that's tiered. Um, so an altar also pictures that temple which had horns in these image, images. And so along with Babel as a backdrop to this vision, we have an altar erected by pagan powers with four horns. And so the vision would be picturing that the beast kingdom, the kingdoms of this world, is an antichrist religious entity challenging God. So not only God's people, but trying to rival God. And of course, in the Old Testament, um, the political powers not only were against the Lord, but they wanted to be worshipped instead. They set up their own gods. And, and that helps us understand the nature of sin because, you know, often people use verses, uh, you know, the Ezekiel 28 verse and the Isaiah 14 verse of wanting to be God, assuming that's about Satan. You're familiar with that, right? Right. But if you read that um, carefully, it's more likely about Adam in the Garden of Eden. Hmm. And because it really describes Adam. Let me, let me read that to you. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now, isn't that exactly what God told Adam not to do and Satan promised him that you shall be as God? Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like Adam the convert to the new satanic religion. Yes, and then verse 15, but you were brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit, reminds us of the curse and death and death. And so it, it reminds us that sin by its very nature, what Adam did in the garden is not just make a mistake. He didn't just make a mistake by listening to his wife. What was the, This was a direct rebellion against God in mm -hmm. wanting to set up himself as God. And so sometimes people look at the covenant of works and they say, um, the judgment seems harsher than the sin hmm. because we look at the sin only as maybe a moment of weakness and eating a piece of fruit. But the very nature of sin is a challenge and a rebellion against God saying, I will be as you. I want your power. I will sit on the throne and rule instead of you. Right. And so sort these like the, nations... Oh, go ahead. Sort of like the prodigal son, right? I wish you were dead so that I could have your inheritance um, minus you. <laughs> yes. And so these nations, they're not simply for political purposes keeping Israel down. Mm -hmm. There's something much darker going on, and it's a rebellion and hatred against God. Hmm. And so that's why Klein brings... And explains why we should see these horns coming out of an altar dedicated to themselves and their God, blaspheming the Most High. Okay. Uh, when we think of sin that way, doesn't that sort of change the way we view the fall? What do you think? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I think those of us who um, have either been students of Meredith Klein's or have have read enough of him are not surprised by how serious and grave Adam's rebellion is but um I mean that picture that Klein just painted here is much darker than even viewing um viewing that in terms of the devil um viewing this as Adam's rebellion um is is even more of a slap in the face just because of him being bearing God's image and being our representative and you know all of that together 
And often it can be a bit confusing because there are so many, relatively speaking, nice and good non-Christians out there. Mm -hmm. In the sense of civil righteousness, as Calvin called it. And yet, even those who are, you know, good conservative people, um, deep down, if they've rejected the gospel, they are living in rebellion against God, wanting to be their own God. Even if their conscience convicts them at times and they try to be good in their own way, um, ultimately they are in utter rebellion against God and, and they're blaspheming God every day by refusing his salvation and thinking that they can live in his world on their own terms. Hmm. And that helps us understand a little bit why the Lord is angry with the world whether he's angry, not just with the worst type of sinners out there, but with all outside of Christ. Right. And that really brings us to the next section where we look at the craftsmen, the four craftsmen, now that we've identified the four horns. The craftsmen are agents of God's vengeance. And Klein brings up next that the nation had interpreted the exile of Judah and Jerusalem as a defeat over God, because that's how they viewed wars back then. If they won a war, it means their God was stronger than the God of the nation they defeated. And so we know from the Bible that God allowed them to come and defeat Israel because he was judging Israel. Right. And yet they had interpreted that wrongly. They had interpreted that as their gods, especially Marduk at that time, was much more powerful than Jehovah. Their gods won, Jehovah lost. And so now God is sending agents of vengeance to punish them for that pride. And notice they're called craftsmen, which means they're very skillful in what they do. And Klein brings up the irony that when God was building his house, when he had Moses and certain people build the tabernacle, for example, it says the spirit gave talents to certain men for the construction. And of course, the irony is that God is giving talents to certain men for destruction. For those for those who attack God's house. Okay. And so these craftsmen have the talent, the ability to cut down these horns. And Klein reminds us that the resources to defeat our enemies are not in us. They come from the Lord himself. That's right. And that, of course, principle carries on throughout the New Testament also. You know, our, our weapons are spiritual. They're not physical or carnal. So Klein then says that it's assumed from the other prophecies in Zechariah that it doesn't say this right away, but after the horns are brought low, the point is that then God's people can be lifted up. And that's that's the reason. So it's not simply vengeance, but it's deliverance. Okay. And he, an example he gave was Babel. Um, even though God came down in vengeance because they're lifting up um, their, you know, their fist in a sense in the face of God, and saying we will build our own temple to heaven, and place our God there, and so He scattered them. The subtext behind that whole section is that if these people weren't defeated, then God's people would have been defeated. Hmm. Remember that first, nothing would stop them. Right. And so the subtext behind that is that God is not only scattering his enemies, he's delivering his people by scattering his enemies. So that whole redemptive judgment for God's people, penal judgment for not God's people. Yes, we saw that same thing in the flood when we went through that in Kingdom Prologue. Right. And another example Klein gives is in Daniel 2, the stone is crushed, representing the nations. And in Daniel 4, from that, a cosmic tree grows unto heaven. And so for the promises to be fulfilled for God's people, God's going to have to do something about those powers that are keeping those promises from being fulfilled. 
And so Klein points out that in this vision, there are two actions of the craftsmen. They scatter them in panic and they cast them down. And the, the Hebrew verb here for casting down, yod, dalit, yod, yod, excuse me, dalit, hot, yod, um, is, is also often used for casting out. Hmm. Klein brings up in the Ugaritic magic spells, it was an act of expulsion to God delivered, or something would be delivered by being cast out. Evil was cast out. And so the image is really of of these horns being cast out because they are Satan's agents. And think of what Adam was to do in the garden um, when he met Satan. He was to protect. He would have, he should have protected God's garden by casting out Satan. That's right. And so it's a picture of God's going to do what Adam failed to do. God's hmm. going to send agents from heaven to cast out. Now, Klein goes on to say that Israel's judgment was completely misinterpreted by the nations, like we said. Um, the nations took that was God was weak. But Israel's judgment was to be a warning to the nations because Israel was in a covenant of works, a typological covenant of works, as we've talked about. And because they broke the covenant, just like the covenant in the garden, they would be expelled from the promised land, from God's presence. And so Israel then was also a microcosm of the whole world who had broken the covenant of works in Adam. Right. And so the message was to the world that if God judged his people first for breaking his law, then he's going to do the same thing to all unbelievers who have broken God's, broken God's law, who are covenant breakers. So whether Israel under Moses or those outside of Israel under Adam, what happens to Israel is a microcosm of what happen, will happen to the nations. And so Israel's judgment, Klein says, one of the purposes was to get the attention of the nations, that they needed to repent and believe in the Savior. And so Klein points out that the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD typologically is the beginning of the end of the world. What happens to Jerusalem is a foretaste and a picture of what's coming to the world, both for breaking um, the works covenant. And so that's important, by the way, when you're trying to understand Matthew 24, because, mm. because the preterists totally miss this. They don't see the connection between Jerusalem typologically being a microcosm of the world. Because what the Lord does is Matthew 24 is he speaks in one, at one level of Jerusalem. But he recognizes what Jerusalem is typifying. The destruction of Jerusalem is typifying the, just, the destruction of the world. And that's why he can move from one to the other so easily. It does, he doesn't stay in Jerusalem. He's only using Jerusalem as a picture of what will happen at the end. So Matthew 24 is about the return of Christ. Absolutely. And for our uninitiated listeners, because I know we have some, uh, what do we mean when we talk about preterists? Oh, thank you for that. That's the idea that the prophecy, the, the coming of Christ in judgment, um, pictured in Matthew 24, is simply speaking historically of Christ coming, um, not physically, but coming in a sense to judge Jerusalem in 70 AD by sending Rome um, to destroy the temple and the city. Okay. That's the preterist view, that that is not speaking of the end of the world, the return of Christ at all in Matthew 24, and some other key passages that normally are thought of as the return of Christ. But Matthew 24 would probably be the key one, correct? That's usually the key one, yes. Okay. But once you get this idea of Jerusalem and Israel as a microcosm, then Matthew 24 just opens up, and it, and it is understandable. Uh, so Klein ends this section with um, that in the prophecy, the agents, uh, this is looking ahead, of course, to the agents of Christ that will defeat Satan for our salvation. 
And so Christ in his first coming defeated Satan's hold on us, his elect. Christ was defeated, the horns against God's people that held them. Satan was bound and God could save all his elect from around the world. He could begin that process. And of course, in his second coming, God in Christ and his angels defeats all the nations and the temple is cleansed and reestablished permanently in the new heavens and earth. The enemies are cast into the sea. And so there's an already to this promise that Christ would do in his first coming where the horns are defeated spiritually. Um, but then in his second coming, physically, the horns are defeated, the nations, the enemies of and then of the church, and then God's people are given their complete salvation. I'll stop for a moment. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm telling you, dear listener, um, I really think that glory in our midst might be Klein's um, greatest argument for republication. I mean, he's talking about it more here than than even he did in uh, Kingdom Prologue. Um, but aside from that... Um, Getting back to the, to these horns, I'm wondering, Todd, do you think that that might still be uh, making an appearance in some contemporary representations of the occult, like uh, goats, um, like uh, in the pentagram kind of idea, or um, gargoyles, or bamphomet, those kinds of things? Well, well, I certainly would, wouldn't exclude applications like this. I, I, you know, I go back to Revelation where the horns seem to represent you know, the nations, the political powers. And it's important to remember that includes all power that isn't Christian. Okay. The very nature of power would be not wanting all Christ's promises to be fulfilled because that would defeat their power. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, that does include America as well as Cuba and um, in any sense. When you, when you have a heart that doesn't believe in the Lord and want, wants their power to continue and live the way they want, um, that would be included in this picture of the horns that eventually God will defeat to bring all the promises to fruition. Okay. And so this final section here, Klein calls the precursors of Zion's glory. So these are pictures of Zion's glory. Um, he quotes Psalm 75.10, the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. So you have the horns being defeated of the, of the nations and the horns of the righteous then lifted up. And there were some, Klein points out, Old Testament temporary fulfillments in a small scale of this, for example, Persia is eventually defeated. Mm -hmm. Of course, Greece just takes their place, and Greece is defeated. Rome takes their place. So um, in one sense, yeah, we can see even in the typology these horns are defeated, but not in any sense that fulfills the promises. Because as we said last week, none of those temporary defeats helps God's people change their situation. Exactly. You know, they're still under Grecian rule, Roman rule, etc. We're still under non-Christian rule. And so these have to look ahead to Christ's return when all these will ultimately be fulfilled. And Klein points out that in the third vision, when it speaks of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, it's rebuilt on a universal scale which could only picture the New Covenant. Right. Certainly there's no time in Old Covenant history where Jerusalem is rebuilt on a universal scale. <laughs> True. And so this promise we looked at last week of Jerusalem being blessed and the cities around it being blessed, later on it comes out that it's really the whole world being blessed with God's presence, which would in the New Covenant be the church now and then, of course, the new heavens and earth. And so the mission, this mission of the exterminators, of the craftsmen, the first act of fulfilling this is really the coming of the rider on the red horse, which is the coming of Christ. Okay. In his first coming, 
defeating our enemies spiritually. And then, like we said, in a second coming when God will defeat all the enemies permanently and dwell with his people, as this pictures. And Klein reminds us of Luke 1, 68. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And so he points out that Christ is called a horn. And so the great irony here is the horn is coming for these other horns. <laughs> right? Right. God's horn, God's power, is coming to save his people, the rider on the red horse, and defeat our enemies. And mm-hmm. so Christ is the original horn. And, and he's the horn that really Babel was counterfeiting. Hmm. Um, in, in erecting their own horns. Christ is the gateway to heaven, not Babel. Right. And so we see the love of Christ for his people here, his jealousness for them, his anger at them, um, people trying to hurt them and keep them from receiving everything God promised, and his promise to do for Israel everything he said. And that's the substance of the second vision. And if that isn't glorious enough, where do we move on to the other visions? Right. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it certainly seems uh, formidable, these, these powerful horns of the bull um, pointed towards God's people. And, of course, the picture of that in Revelation 12 is Satan chasing them into the wilderness. Right. And yet God hiding and protecting them. Good place to end. I like it. Thank you so much, Todd. I um, I really enjoyed this discussion. All right, everyone. Uh, we would love to hear what you think, your thoughts, your questions, um, anything. You can email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. And the podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. And you can also join the discussion at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added there. And Todd and I will be back again next week to talk to you some more about Zechariah's visions. 